Okay, welcome to the Creator's Pearl podcast for Sunday, March 21st, 2021. We're going to have a special message on this podcast. We're going to play a message from our pastor in Goshen, Indiana, Larry Troyer. And it's on something we've discussed or introduced before on the Creator's Pearl. It's concerning the seven eyes of God or the seven spirits of God and how that is vital to have to, in order to communicate with our Creator. I think we need to list the seven eyes. So the seven eyes or the seven spirits or the seven candlesticks, those are always it's listed, is wisdom, understanding, knowledge, might, spirit of counsel, fear of the Lord, and the anointing. Yes. We we may find that we have a gap between us and God where we're not hearing God and we think God's not hearing us. And there's an interruption in communication, direct communication. Well, the seven eyes are here to give us that communication, to restore that back to how God originally intended for it to be and how Jesus came back to restore this. And the seven eyes is to have a true relationship, a spirit and truth relationship with the Father. All right, well, here we go. Without further ado, here's the message from Pastor Larry Troyer on the seven eyes of God. We have prophets in the Old Testament said, the Lord said, who shall I send? And the man of God said, here I am, send me. So he was greatly increased beyond what he was called to be. And there's no limit on God. When he wants it, it's whomever the Spirit of the Lord rests upon. And see, the first thing in the first church, in the first sign of having the release of the seven eyes or seven spirits of God upon you is love. And so the Spirit of the Lord is love. And we've got to look at it in that way. And when we do, we can go through almost anything because on the other side, Paul says it's rough going through it. But once you get on the other side, you're a new creation. Every time you go through something, the more severe it is, the more apt you are to stay in that place where God called you because it's safe. And that enters into the fear of the Lord then. What I want to do this morning is twofold. One is to go over all the things about the seven eyes again, adding some things. And also, I have talked about the seven eyes of God, but I've never told the people that read the newspaper what the seven eyes of God really are and how they function. It's time now to let them know what the seven eyes really are and the availability of it, and to gauge where they're at with that in uh, being able to communicate with God. And so in John 4, verse 23, let's start with uh, 21. Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, ye you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. All right? God wants us to worship in the spirit. And to worship in the spirit means that you're able to connect to the spiritual world. Now, there's two spiritual worlds. The spirit world of Satan and the spirit world of the kingdom of God. And it's not hard to tell the difference once you understand it, but before that, it is difficult to understand. The biggest differences is that when you are born again, there's no condemnation that can come on you as long as you have faith in the living God and it lives in you. Where Satan will condemn and accuse probably the very first signs of anything is those that continue accusation are in the kingdom of Satan. And that's rampant in the world today. Nobody wants to take responsibility. They just want what's 
what is theirs that they have a right to have. But in the kingdom of God, the only rights you have is what God gives you. And he gives it to you according to your works. If your works are following Satan, you won't get any from heaven. But if you die to the things of the world and then yield to the Spirit of the living God, then there is no limit to what you can do in Christ. I can do all things, Paul said, for those that are in Christ Jesus. And so the first thing that happens here in 23 is that we are to worship the Lord in the Spirit. And you can't worship in the Spirit thinking of doing the next thing Monday morning, what you're going to do when you get up. You're to set that aside because that is a driving force in you if you can't set it aside. And I know it's hard sometimes. It's not easy. But that's why we're under grace. And then the other thing is truth. He's looking for true worshipers. Those are two qualifications you need to truly worship God. Because in verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Must. What does that mean? You haven't got any other choice. No other way. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then all of a sudden the woman becomes religious. Anyway, uh, we'll let the rest of that rest there. And then in chapter 14, John 14, 26. All right, I'm giving you two of the things that you need to do to touch God and to hear Him. You can't hear Him if you don't go in the spiritual realm and live there because your mind is too full of the worldly things that I just got through saying is that we are so driven that all we think about is making more of this or more of that or doing this or doing that. And we lose the ability to hear God's voice if we don't worship in spirit and truth. Then in verse 26 of John 14, But the Comforter, who, which is the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, all right, He's going to teach you all things. He's a teacher. And bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said. So a teacher is uh, one that teaches the past. He can't teach you the future like he can the past. We can see the trends that's happening in the future of this nation. But we won't know the true effect of it until it's gone and we look back just the way it is. And it's the same way with someone that has been giving a word from the Lord, that it's difficult when you're going through it to understand that word. But when you come out on the other side and you look back, it may be a year, it may be five, 10, 15 years before you know. And you look back and you see where God has done this in your life, this in your life, this in your life, this in your life, and this in your life. And all of them is a road that you have increased and you look back and say, wow, look what God has done in my life. And that is to give you comfort and to give you confidence that you are on the right road leading towards and fulfilling the will of God in the kingdom of God. And then in chapter 16, starting with verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, the Holy Spirit is the Comforter in that he will show you where you're at and he will lead you to where you need to go. And when that takes place, there's great comfort in you because you're not fighting God, but that you are in the will of God. And that is making peace with God. It's very important that you make peace with God because if he's not happy with you, you're in danger of not being forever with him. 
There's people I would never want to be around again. I met people. Everybody has. All right. Then in 13, verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, people that won't accept truth cannot be led by the Holy Spirit in truth. You have to come to a place that you want to come out of the world and live in the Spirit with Christ and also then let Him teach you truth that you might truly be comforted. There is no rest in lies. There is no rest in the kingdom of Satan. They're tormented every morning they get up. But the Spirit of truth will comfort you and He will guide you into all truth For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. All right? Every person in here has the opportunity that if you are worshiping him in spirit and in truth, at some point he will show you of things to come that he's going to use you for. It may not be totally clear, But it's enough to know that you're going into a good and new place in God. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it to you. There is a huge verse there. The Holy Spirit is going to glorify Jesus because he's going to take the things that the Father gave Jesus, he's going to give them to you because if you are like his son, He will give you the things that he gave his son to be successful on this earth. And he's going to show it to you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take a mine and shall show it unto you. So the things that are Jesus, he is the Holy Spirit is going to take those things. And what is the greatest thing that Jesus can give us? Number one is salvation. And that salvation is is being born again. The second greatest thing that he can do is that when we are born again, we are whole and complete. That means that when we are born in the physical, we have the five senses to communicate in this world. And the sixth one is our sense of conscience that tells us or speaks to us if we will listen wisdom. Now, when we are born again in the heavenlies, there is something that happens that is the most wonderful thing that can happen because in the Old Testament, the common person did not hear God. Those that were anointed could hear God, but those that weren't, and even then it was very uh, strenuous processes to go through of cleansing so that you wouldn't pollute the word that God gave you. And so what we want to do this morning is introduce the seven senses that God gives us to communicate in the Spirit and live in truth. Now, how important is that? It's it's life or death. And yet the church hardly knows anything of that about it. All right, when I was uh, a young man, what, what caused me to seek God, and I didn't know anything about any of this, was that when I would pray and when I would read the Word, I had it in my mind, but when I prayed, there was a gap between me and where God was. And I didn't realize that to be able to bring that gap together so I could hear God was to worship Him in the Spirit. But I didn't know how to worship him in the spirit and to worship him in truth. And I knew that there were a lot of phonies in the church, just were. I even had a pastor that was a phony. He was a yes man. He would speak and I would, he would say things and I'm saying, I don't believe you. Because if you really was what you say you are, you'd be different and you're not. And I didn't know what the answer was. But I know he wasn't what he said he was. And so I struggled for years trying to understand how to be able to hear God communicate with him 
and to break that gap. But if I would have really understood that verse where he says that gap where I know how to fellowship with God, and the only way I can do it is to go into the spiritual realm of God's kingdom, not Satan's kingdom, not in all kinds of hokey-pokey stuff, but to know the living God that created all things and will exist forever, and that I would be invited to live with him forever if I would worship him in spirit and in truth. And as I saw it, and I cried out, the Lord began to take me through a process of being destroyed with the desires of this world. And that's the first step that has to take place within you, is to hate you being in charge. All I want is God to be in charge of my life. That's all I said for months and years. Lord, you take over and be in my life. And so, when the Lord came into my room one night and lit up the room, and the things that I was asking to know, he just said, can you trust me to do the right thing? And when he said that, his love poured into my heart, and I was never the same again. Even though I had very few answers, I knew that I could trust him because he loved me, because I sought him. And not money come to me, not whatever it is of the world, but I just wanted him. And that was all I wanted. And if anybody didn't have the answer, I went on to somewhere else. And I couldn't find anybody that would answer my questions. I knocked on the door of pastors, and they said, well, that's a, that's a good thought, but I don't know. And finally, the Lord began to open my heart, because he said that he would teach us the deep things of God. All right, so in Isaiah 11, starting in verse 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and that branch and that rod was Jesus, came through Jesse, which came through David. David was a representation of the king of kings, who is Jesus. And he said in verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now, you got to remember that everything that Jesus had, the Holy Spirit will come and give it to you. No, he won't give you the same degree of authority because Jesus was given all authority, and God stopped him from nothing because he had no sin in him and never did. But until we become an eternal presence in us, we have now an everlasting presence until he comes and gives us eternal life that, that lasts forever. If he'd give us eternal life that lasts forever now, we'd be like Satan. We'd fall, and we'd be living forever and ever and ever and ever. That's what uh, Satan's got to do. So the first spirit or the first thing that God gives us when we are born again is a love that the Spirit of our Father has in Him. If you look at the seven churches in Revelation, the very first church was what? You lost your first love. Each of these seven, if you don't understand these seven, go to the churches in chapter 2 and 3, and you can study and see what each spirit that is in God was given to mankind to overcome the seven sins of the early church. The first one is the Spirit of the Lord. It's going to rest upon him. And so when you're born again, the Spirit of God rests upon you and will be your guide if you don't resist Him. And then the second one is the Spirit of wisdom. Wisdom tells us which road to go on. And we need to have wisdom to know the ways of God. And then the third thing 
is understanding. We're going to get into some, some scripture that has understanding. The fourth thing is the spirit of counsel. It's a wonderful part of what God has given the born-again believers that worship in spirit and in truth. He gives you the spirit of counsel. For a long time, I operated the most in that, in that someone would come and ask me something, and I would say, I have no idea what to tell you. But within a minute, I'd be telling them what to do. That's because the spirit of counsel would come on me and give me the, the wisdom and understanding of that person to bring him into a right place with God. And then uh, the spirit of counsel and the spirit of might. Might is different than power. Might has to do with God's glory on you that the world cannot touch. The glory that is on you will be on you for all eternity. And power is needed to do certain things uh, like healing, the power to heal. Uh, we don't use the might to heal, but we use power to heal. And power comes from God too. But uh, sometimes might and power are used as one. And the spirit of knowledge. You know, you got to have wisdom to understand how to create something like a car, the engine. Somebody had wisdom that they could put cylinders together that drove a, a crankshaft that would make a car move by having the pistons go up and down and drawing the gas in, bringing it up, and having a spark plug explode it, and it goes down, and then it comes back up and pushes all the fumes out and sucks in the gas, and it does that, if it's a 1,000 RPMs, it does that a 1,000 times a minute. So to have knowledge, you first have to have wisdom and understanding, you have to have counsel, and you have to have the spirit of might, the glory to be able to understand and see the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is so awesome, it's, uh, it's, it makes the earthly teacher foolish. Uh, for instance, some time ago, a couple of years back or whatever it was, they always said that there was a little fish that's way down in the bottom of the limestone and that it's been extinct for millions and millions and millions and billions of years. So when they had cameras, they took the camera and put it down about a thousand feet or so and they saw those little fish, same fish. And there's two things that's wrong with all of that is that we know that a fish within four or five days will start to decay and be gone. But these fish were completely the size that they were when they died. So it had to happen in minutes or in hours to get a skeleton of all the little fish things that are shells and everything that are in limestone. Limestone is found all over the world. And when the flood came, it was 150 days that the water covered the earth, 20 feet above the highest mountain. We don't know how high the mountains were at that time, but there were mountains. It could have been the same as what it is today. But when the flood came, it says it broke up the deep. The water came up out of the deep, and the water fell down from heaven. Then when it come to get rid of the water, he made a wind to blow up on it, and it dried up the water. And where is the water today? But it's in the limestone. Limestone is a fourth dimension of water. And therefore, it's very easy to see how all of the limestone could have all of the different kinds of fish and snails and things like that in limestone when all of it was stacked thousands of feet even. Uh, as it dried, it could have dried... Uh, uh, five, six, seven inches, maybe a foot in a day that the sediment came down and enclosed those little fish and whatever it was in, in, in a day, which would make sense because then it's a full body like it is now when you find it in limestone. But they thought that it was gone, and when they put that camera down there and saw them, they had it in the news for a little bit, but they quickly took it away because it destroyed their ability to say that evolution took place. 
it didn't. It was created, and God brought judgment to the earth because of the wickedness. And when he dried up the waters, it piled up at the bottoms first. And so the fish that were the deepest on the bottom, they're the ones that got the first layers of dried limestone. And if you look today, when you're driving down the road where a road goes through a limestone hill, and there's all different colors there. What is that? It's the different ways that the winds blew and all the dirt. If it was red dirt, they had red limestone. If it was white, they had white limestone. If they had gray, it was gray uh, soil that came from it. And it didn't happen in millions of years. It happened in 150 days. Now, where was I at? Let, let's start looking now at uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 14, let's go with 13. Here Paul talks about, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, or one of his uh, helpers. Verse 13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. All right? Here we see that not only in the physical do we feed milk to babies because they can't handle, you know, two days old, they don't, they don't take on a ribeye or something like that. You know, they... They just get milk, and they love it. They're content with it. So the word of righteousness, which is the seven eyes of God, it's not for a babe, but they learn to function in it. Verse 14, when they become of age, but strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, Truth is what? Truth is the way of the kingdom of God and the Creator. And so what Christ came was to die for us to break the power of sin that we might be able to walk in the righteousness of God, which is the seven senses. Righteousness has to do with daily living. And so a baby is unskilled in his righteousness. He has to be disciplined the same way When you are born again, you must be disciplined by the Holy Spirit and Christ so that you become adults, putting away childish things. So when you are full age, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. Now, let's let's look at this. The senses that are the senses that are exercised, the seven spirits of God, they are capable of because the Holy Spirit puts those seven senses in us. We only had five in the physical. But now he's given us seven to be able to communicate with heaven. And when God started to open this up to me, then it began to change so that I could go from speaking and praying and lifting that up to God and understanding him and he understanding me because we fellowship out of the seven senses of the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of men. That's why God's ways are not man's ways and man's ways are not God's ways. Therefore, what God says, let every man be a liar, but God be exalted because he is truth. And so therefore, we can blow out that gap by functioning in the seven senses of God, which is first loving Him, and then walking in wisdom, and understanding, and counsel, and might, and knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. All of those working together in us, and when they are in us, we know that Jesus is in us, because that's who Jesus was, the seven spirits of God. He functioned that way on the earth. He functioned the same way that he's asking you and me to be able to do. And I've lived that way for 30-some years. And there is a clash between those that try to discern or to speak or try to correct you by talking out of man's thinking because man's thinking is of this world, which is corrupt But the things of God are found by functioning in these seven spirits, which is Christ living in us because that's what he functioned in. And so we become full age, 
when those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Those that walk in darkness don't even know what they're doing. We have such darkness in our country today that we're in a very dangerous place because the church has no power, because they're not functioning in the spirits of heaven, they're functioning in the spirits of the earth and under the earth. They're telling their people to worship things that are not even God. Much of this, the modern singings today don't come from heaven. They come from lyrics of the kingdom of Satan. You think God accept that? You're deceived if you think you will. All right, now let's go a little bit further. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. There you go. Seven spirits of God. Your seven senses. He has blessed us in heavenly places because now we can communicate with him and rule and reign in the heavenlies with him. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love. There's the first census right there. We should realize that he has blessed you in heavenly places. And if you know that, you will serve him and there's no other place for you to go. There's times that you want to run, but where shall I go? There's a song saying, where shall I go but to the Lord? Then in uh, verse 8, wherein he hath abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. All right, wisdom. Wisdom gives us the ability, because this was a godly nation in its foundations, we was able to create and invent things that was never invented in all the times of the human being upon the earth. And uh, verse 9 then. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself. All right? Having made known the mystery of his will, before I received the seven eyes of God, I had no idea what the mysteries of God's will was. But he's opened that up to me and shown me what it is. What an incredible honor we have, if we are faithful to him, that he will give us for all eternity to live in, with him, among him, and those that love him. All right, and then in uh, verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worked all things after the counsel of his own will. All right, he gives us counsel. Uh, the Bible says that he knew us before he created the world. So therefore, it's not predestined like we think it is, like I, you hear, that, well, we, we're predestined to do a certain thing, and, and uh, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm going to end up in the same place anyway. That isn't the predestined he's talking about. He's talking about a predestined in that I am giving you this gift and this gift to be able to accomplish this, and I'm placing you now in this day and this hour to do that will. And if you choose to do it, then I not only will call you, but I'll teach you to become faithful then. And that's the predestined. It is not that you can do anything you want and you are predestined to the same thing. No, I was predestined for a call, but I went beyond my predestination because I was willing to do what other people weren't willing to do. And God looks for someone that will put, that he can rest his word on and accomplish his word before it goes back to the Father. It says in Isaiah that his word is going to go forth and it will not return to him void, but it will accomplish the purpose in which it was sent. And if the people that was predestined to do that won't do it, he'll give it to someone else. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Okay, in verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, 
and that the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. There's what I was talking about. If God would just open your eyes of understanding what you could have if you had these seven eyes to begin to do it. And that's why Paul was, was praying for the Ephesians to get these seven. We've already spoken now on five out of the seven. And the sixth one is next. What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to his mighty works or mighty power? There is where the, the power and the might come together, but it isn't always that way. It's either might or power, and we have some that shows that. Then in verse 20, And he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead to set him in his own right hand in heavenly places. And we are then called to be able to go in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and fellowship with him. Now, what does that mean? It means that if we was not born again into the spirit, we would be on the earth because our flesh bodies will not allow us to go anywhere but on earth. We're trying to... Uh, get to Mars, and put our flags on it and say, we own Mars. Welcome to Mars, 127 degrees below zero. Have a good corn crop. Enjoy the food. How dumb do you get? Dumb, dumb, dumb. So we have the capability of ruling and reigning with him in heavenly places with the seven eyes of God. Colossians chapter 1 is the same thing. I'm not going to turn to it. We don't have the time, but you can read it. Proverbs 2.1. Actually, the first eight chapters of Proverbs is where Solomon talks about the seven eyes of God and that his father taught him that. It wasn't that Solomon brought that on, but that David taught his sons about the seven eyes of God. Zechariah chapter 3 also has about the stone and the seven eyes. The stone represents Christ, and the seven eyes represent the Spirit of heaven, how to destroy Satan's kingdom and defeat him once and for all. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia... Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. All right? The seven spirits or the seven eyes is the same thing. Taste is an eye. If you didn't have your taste buds working right, you couldn't do anything. If all five of your senses were dead, you would be, get, you would be given a, a name of what? Brain dead. You're brain dead. Why? Because you can't communicate with the world you're living in. And if you can't communicate with the world that you said you was born again into, you're brain dead. Brain dead. You should be extremely upset that no one has taught you the seven eyes of God. Because then you can't communicate toward the place you said you was born into. But with the seven eyes, you break that gap between you and God, and then the communication takes place because you're now functioning in the seven eyes that was designed for you to communicate with the Creator. And if you don't believe that, I feel sorry for you. And in Daniel chapter 2, 14 to uh, 23, also talks about where he praises God out of his love for God as a young man, could have even been 20 years old or less. We don't know how old he was when he functioned. But as soon as he was given common food and not the food of the kings, God gave him the eyes of God. And he communicated from that point on. And Nebuchadnezzar had to stand up after seven years of eating grass out in the wilderness and said, there's no God like Daniel's God. He can do what he wants to. Then in chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 5, 
And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there's a great sea of glass. All right? Jesus was among the seven spirits of God, and, the, and wherever he was, they were. And uh, those that learn to communicate, those that cannot go into the realm of the Spirit and fellowship out of these seven eyes cannot be in the army of God like they think they are. It's not possible. How can you be in an army that you can't fellowship with and don't know what's going on? A lot of people say, oh, I'm in the army of God. I'm in the army of God. Hallelujah, I'm in the army. What are you doing? Nothing. Paul said, we are not those that beat the air, but we pull down principalities and powers in heavenly places. Well, if you look at Daniel chapter 2, the fear of the Lord is all over Daniel. He does exactly what the Father wants him to do. To as many as understand the census of the born-again believer, the wealth that is there, because there are so few people that go into the heavenlies in the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Satan. There's a lot of witches and everything else that are in the, in the spirit realm, but they're in the kingdom of Satan. They're not in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, who created all things and made it. And it's Satan that tries to make you believe that we just evolved. Churches believe that they just evolved. Then where's their creator? Where's their salvation then? There isn't any. The only person that can save you is Jesus Christ. Not Allah, not Buddha, not any of the others. Only Christ. And I'm sure that the snowflakes have a, a name for Jesus because he said, I am the door and the only way. My prayer is that all of you will walk in the eyes of God and be joined in that mighty army without fear of losing because God is the Almighty.